I started seeing the birds in the neighborhood about five years ago. About three years ago, uh, they started hanging out on my balcony. And at the time, I just thought it was one. And I just stood there for a minute. And then it turned its head around and looked at me. And then it fell over backwards and flew away like Batman. Um, and then one day, another one showed up at the same time. And I thought to myself, what is this? Um, and they started nesting. Now that they're there, it's kind of like having Wild Kingdom on the balcony, so it's, it's free entertainment. Three years ago, Daisy Arashiba lost the balcony of his high-rise condo to Steve and Linda, a pair of peregrine falcons. These 28th floor flower boxes supplied the perfect nest for the pair and their new family. And it wasn't a one-time deal, because year after year, they keep coming back. The first year, they didn't lay egg, uh, they laid eggs, but the eggs didn't hatch, so I figured it was a failed nest. And the people at the Peregrine Program were like, that's oh, a failed nest, they're probably not going to come back. And so when they came back last year, it was like, surprise! The Peregrine Falcon. With diving speeds up to 200 miles per hour, they're the fastest animal on the planet, which comes in handy when they want to snatch up other birds for dinner. Naturally cliff dwellers, they've adapted to living in cities and using high-rise buildings for nests. They're also an endangered species, which means that when they landed on Daisy's balcony, there wasn't a thing he could do about it. Well, they said that these were federally protected animals and that we can not uh, we can no longer uh, chase them away, we can't disturb the nest, but they were very excited, you know, that they had another pair that were nesting in Chicago. But luckily, Daisy was happy to have the company. Not only has he documented the bird's activities on his Instagram account, he's allowed professional nature photographers to live in his apartment to check out Linda and Steve as well. Oh yeah, and he named them. We decided that the last name could be called, would be the Perrys. And so we went with Steve Perry from Journey, Linda Perry from Four Non Blondes, uh, then the kids Luke Perry and Katie Perry, and then uh, Joe Perry from Aerosmith and Refrigerator Perry. No word yet on what he'll name the two eggs that Linda and Steve are currently protecting. But for now, they're just as much a part of Daisy's home as Daisy is. They'll be here for a little while longer before once again moving on. Because year to year, Daisy never knows whether or not they'll come back. All he can do is look to the horizon and see if there's anything approaching in the distance. I just, I cannot get enough of that story. I know, great story, Jake Hamilton. And some great pictures. And One Chicago native is hoping to change the meaning of the word. Elizabeth Matthews here now. And Elizabeth, he's doing it by opening a restaurant on the south side called Chirac Cuisines. Jeff, he grew up around violence and was this close to living a lifestyle of gangs and crime until he discovered his talent behind the grill. This 21-year-old man is a Chicago native, Le Cordon Bleu graduate, and now restaurant owner. I know I wasn't always good, but I know people do change. Antoine Jeffries describes a life growing up on the west and south sides of Chicago as a deadly one, losing six friends to gun violence. I was like part of the problem. I realized I was part of the problem because of the ways I was going about to, um, you know, to get money and try to try to obtain things that I've seen and wanted. Just before he was sucked into a life of violence, he found his gift through the Chicago Art Beat Studios mentoring program. He's now using that talent at Chirac Cuisines, an American, Jamaican, and Italian restaurant and small grocery store. Yeah, they come get dinner or get, you know, some dinner for later that they might want to cook themselves. <laughs> that name is controversial for customers. Yes, and, and to me, I think that would cause more shooting. Like, it implies that the entire city is like a war zone, you know, Chirac, Iraq. I've put it up there because I live here, and I've been a part of the problem, and I understand why it's called that and why kids feel the way they do. Jeffrey says he grew up calling Chicago Chirac. He hopes now, through his success story, he can make the term a positive one. Residents who don't like the name say they'll still eat there. And after hearing Jeffrey's story, think maybe the name, not such a bad thing. That kind of does change my opinion because that, that's amazing. And that's what I'm here for, to show that you can make something negative and turn it into something positive with all the odds against you. Chirac Cuisines has a double meaning. He first wants to bring a positive meaning to the term, and he says Chirac stands for Chicago Real Authentic Quality Food. That's located near East 79th and Jeffrey on the south side. Jeff? All right, Elizabeth Matthews reporting tonight. Elizabeth, thank you. Solving crime by avoiding the criminal justice system completely. It is a unique idea taking shape in the North Lawndale neighborhood. As Dane Placco explains, think of it as a community court where residents work with both the criminals and the victims to end the cycle. 
Welcome to North Lawndale, by any measure one of Chicago's most troubled neighborhoods. High unemployment, poverty, and crime. Nearly 7 out of 10 adult men who live here has a felony conviction, including Alan Bradley. Would something like this have helped you when you were younger? I believe so. A whole lot would help me. Then, what y'all having now, it would help me a whole lot. For the first time, the Cook County Circuit Court has approved a restorative justice community court that will be based in North Lawndale. Funded by a $200,000 grant, the community court will give defendants between 18 and 26 years old who committed nonviolent felonies or misdemeanors a new choice. It is a voluntary process uh, by which uh, the defendant and the victim and the community would come together and they would take a look at how we repair the harm from crime. Cook County Judge Colleen Sheehan is spearheading the project. She says rather than go through the legal meat grinder that would likely result in incarceration or a felony conviction, the volunteer defendants will have their cases heard in the neighborhood with community input. So the community is an essential part of this. Um, where they would participate and really take ownership of, of the court and take ownership of identifying what the solutions are. And instead of prison or a felony, the defendants will be offered neighborhood help. In ranging from workforce development, job placement, job training, to mental health counseling, family counseling, drug counseling, after school program, extracurricular activities, getting back into school. Something former defendants like Alan Bradley wish would have been available to them. And I think it would be a good that uh, Lawndale community could have their own, you know, uh, justice. That initial grant will only be enough to provide community court for about 100 defendants, which is why organizers are looking for other revenue sources. They say if it's successful in breaking the cycle, community courts could pop up in other troubled Chicago neighborhoods. Back to you. Tax day. It's like the holiday season for some it tends to sneak up on you. Well, believe it or not, it's here and a lot of people are cutting it close. This H&R block on the city's southwest side sees the same thing every year. Last minute tax filers trying to beat the deadline, which this year is Monday, April 18th. We have coffee and some water there. Make yourself at home. With extended hours until 11 o'clock, they can help navigate what is a daunting task for some. The younger filers are, I think, my favorite because sometimes they come in there a little nervous and a little afraid. They don't know what to expect, and it's always um, an exciting part for me to kind of educate them. Kimberly Butler has seen it all from the simple return. Here, what did you bring with you today? Some income tax sheets for the year. Get my income tax done. To the more complicated business ones. And most of the documents you need to file your taxes start rolling in shortly after the new year, begging the question why wait till mid April? Time, I think, is one of the biggest factors. People's lives are just so busy now. Uh, I just do it to get it out of the way. Uh, I know it. The longer it is to the deadline, the more hassle it is, the more people start going in. And I'd rather get it out of the way, move on with my life. There's also a reluctance because people fear what they may owe. It's one of the many reasons Butler suggests not going through the process alone. You want to make sure you get all those credits and deductions and get the largest legal refund that you can. Bottom line, don't fear the process. And if you're lucky and a refund is owed, maybe you'll have some extra play money unless it's already spoken for. Pay bills, um, just pay bills, that's what you gotta do with it. Then there's always next year. And are you worried about an audit? Well, the professionals say that may just be a game of luck. A computer could draw your social security number. Also, they say that your chances are greater of being audited if you make less than $50,000 a year. Back to you.